Hi, everybody. Still have a few people coming in, but I'm going to get started. Um, welcome to the fifth installment of the IFL virtual series. My name is Rebecca Monrat. Some of you know me. Um, I'm the project manager at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs um, at UBC. And I've been at the center for 12 years now and helping run the IFL program since its inception in 2013. I'm thrilled to see so many familiar faces and new faces here today. Uh, I have just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, the first thing is that you would have heard the recording when you, when you came into the room that we are recording this session and we'll be posting the video on our website after the fact. Um, however, uh, any activity in the chat will not be captured and we're leaving the chat open so you can introduce yourselves and you can also post your questions to the chat or you can direct message them to me. I'll be your Q&A moderator today and I will either call on you to unmute yourself and state your question or I can state your question on your behalf depending on what you choose to do. Um, at different points throughout the session today we'll be polling the audience and asking you to share your thoughts in the chat. Uh, please keep an eye out and be ready for that. And of course, as always, please be mindful and respectful during the session and in the chat. And now I will hand the mic over to you, Jerry, to welcome everyone formally. Done this so much lately, uh, <laughs> I should know to unmute oneself, but uh, that's how uh, things still work. Okay, so thank you everyone. And before we begin, um, uh, just introduce myself and, and what we've been doing. Uh, and a quick uh, couple of housekeeping items as well. Uh, I'm Gerald Beyer, uh, Jerry Beyer. I am the acting director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at UBC. Uh, and we are the pioneers uh, of the uh, Institute for Future Legislators, uh, which we've been doing, as Becca said, since uh, 2013. My colleague Max Cameron and I uh, put the program together at those years, and we've been doing it at UBC continuously until COVID-19. Um, so before we formally start uh, with our panel, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, that we meet today uh, scattered as we are in, in, in various uh, parts of the country on traditional territories of indigenous peoples uh, who are the inhabitants of the land we call Canada. Uh, I come to you from the unceded land of the, uh, of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples uh, who inhabit the lower mainland of British Columbia uh, and, and, and host us at UBC as well. Uh, and our partners at Ryerson University are located on the territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee sorry, and the Huron-Wendat. Uh, that uh, territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, uh, Treaty Number 13, and the Williams Treaties. Uh, but people joining us uh, from various locales across the country are obviously in different places. So I just ask you to take a moment to reflect on uh, the, the peoples who are your host uh, and where you are. Uh, and, and kind of acknowledge the fact that it's that we can't list so many people uh, because uh, it's just uh, there's so much diversity and so much going on in so many places uh, without the country. So we should be struck by the scale of that, uh, that we can't even uh, inventory all those uh, peoples. All right, thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge that we're entering at a time of, uh, of tremendous, uh, we're, we're meeting at a time of tremendous uh, tumult in our towns and cities in North America and across the world. Uh, black people, indigenous peoples, uh, and other persons of color have often have too often been forgotten by our political institutions uh, and denied the fundamental freedoms, opportunities, and protections uh, guaranteed to them by our constitution. Uh, so I'm sure, as you all are, you're impressed. I'm impressed by the uh, tremendous courage of people uh, taking to the streets in the COVID times to uh, to acknowledge, express this uh, frustration, uh, and an unwillingness to accept the status quo. Uh, any longer. Uh, and, and our topic today is the media. Uh, media portrayals of racialized citizens uh, have really contributed to systemic racism and, and media and communications I think are a critical uh, ground for reconciling and repairing some of the inequities that have fostered this period of rethinking in the first place. So I'm excited that we get to talk about that uh, today. So this is the fifth, as Rebecca said, of a series of virtual practitioner sessions that we will hold to try and replicate some of uh, the content we'd normally delivered in our institutes, either in Vancouver or Toronto. And we have not been able to do that, of course, in person this year. Our intention, and I'm speaking on behalf of both teams, of course, uh, is to offer full in-person programs uh, next year, which you can learn more about from our respective websites. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll see some slides uh, later in the session if, if those are uh, helpful for you to, to get in contact. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, the Institute was started as an opportunity to 
give people a chance to experience some of uh, what you would experience as a legislator in Canada, either provincially or federally, uh, and uh, to, to get some real life advice from people who've done it before uh, and, and real experience in, in trying to do some of that, as well as opportunities to kind of reflect on uh, what it's like to be in the seat of, of a legislator. Um, Last year, we were able, uh, really uh, excited to uh, start a partnership with Ryerson in which we expanded this to central Canada, uh, and we hope to continue to do that in the future. So thank you for joining us for that. Today's topic uh, is effective public communication, essentially, uh, and it's something that we've always had as a part of IFL uh, in our in-person sessions. Uh, we've seen the gold standard, I think, of effective public communication in the personage of uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry here in British Columbia. Uh, but not all efforts at public communication go all that well <laughs> and policy proposals uh, and things get lost in the in in the messaging sometimes so part of what we hope to do uh, is give you some experience at practicing at that uh, in a world of fake news of talking points and spin i think being authentic and this is i think some i'm presaging a little bit of what allison's advice might be is is really important uh, and and learning how to think about that is i think what we would like to help you do um, we'll also get a chance to do a couple demonstrations, interviews with you uh, today. So those are always good fun for people who've been in them uh, in before. So uh, my last task is just to introduce our uh, panelists for today. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it over to them to, to start the, the session. Alison Brodel uh, is a senior producer with the CBC, uh, been a journalist for nearly three decades, covering everything from elections to Olympics uh, and producing award-winning investigative stories. She's been at, the, at the, the start of a number of familiar programs and, and, uh, and, and things that you've heard or seen uh, with the CBC. She's currently a managing editor of digital content for CBC, uh, where she's also worked as a reporter, producer, uh, and host for a range of TV and radio programs, including The Current. And she's been speaking to us uh, as, a, as a former Vancouverite and now Torontonian uh, at IFL for the past six years. And, and we're really happy to have her back uh, and, and have her working with her Ryerson alma mater uh, as well, which uh, is a place she graduated from. Elamine Abdul Mahmoud uh, is a news curation editor with BuzzFeed News and a columnist for CBC's Radio Q, CBC Radio's Q. Uh, I, could list a bunch of other things as well. He appears regularly as a culture and con uh, comment, current affairs uh, commentator for CBC News and CTV. Uh, he's co-host with, uh, with Canada's best debate moderator, uh, Rosie uh, Barton of, of the Party Lines podcast. Uh, and I understand is gonna be hosting the Sunday edition for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I think his music taste uh, rivals uh, all, all out there. And so it'll be a great uh, opportunity to hear some interesting things. His writings appeared in McLean's, Chatelaine, uh, the Guardian, and most recently for, uh, that I saw was in Rolling Stone, of all places. So his debut collection of essays, Son of Elsewhere, arrives, I think, in the fall of 2021. So we're really excited to have these two wonderful people uh, to help us uh, cut through the noise uh, and, and teach us a little bit about uh, effective communication. So I'll turn it over to you, Allison. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jerry, and really happy to be here virtually uh, with you all. Uh, and uh, this uh, being virtual uh, avoids me having to answer the question, why on earth would you move from Vancouver to Toronto? Uh, but it was, it was for my great job uh, at the CBC as, uh, as Jerry has described. And uh, it's great being here and I'm learning lots and happy that, that I could continue uh, doing this work with you guys, with Ryerson and, uh, and with UBC. So um, yeah, we've got a great presentation to give you today. We've got some video examples to play for you uh, so that we can all learn from, uh, from them uh, if the Zoom gods are willing uh, today <laughs> to playing our videos. Uh, and then we're going to do, as, as Jerry mentioned, a couple of real-time political interviews with, uh, with our volunteers, volunteers uh, who have stepped up to be our uh, to, our, to be our interview subject today. Those poor, poor volunteers, they have no idea what they have in store for them. Um, I'm excited to do it. And then also we'll, we'll spend a bit of time talking about social media, which is regrettably my home address. It's sort of where I live and it's sort of a place that I love and hate talking about. And it's gonna be, I think, hopefully, um, a, a, a way to talk through the, the pitfalls of social media so that you never fall into them because Social media can be amazing, it can be your best friend, but it can also just uh, reinforce all of the destructive habits that so many people have. So let's get started. Uh, let's start with uh, a bit of an overview. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, and, and, and think about why we need to talk about this. 
um, the, the art of political communication is so key to success in politics. Uh, it is, it, it's a difficult time to be broaching this topic. Uh, the media is under attack. Uh, politicians are under attack. Democracy is under attack. Democracy gets caught in the middle of, of all of this. Um, and, and by democracy, I, I mean a bunch of things, including the ability for citizens to inform themselves or be informed so that they can make informed decisions and choices, uh, so that they can choose when to protest, as Jerry was alluding to, uh, when things don't seem right. Um, but the, the getting that information as, as a citizen uh, is difficult. Getting the information out as a politician or a member of the media is difficult because we've gone through quite an evolution. And as Elamine mentioned, social media was actually supposed to add to democracy, uh, but instead it's made it easier uh, to spread fake news. Uh, and uh, regrettably, that term has now just become uh, commonplace. Uh, we can't have a conversation in our newsrooms. Uh, politicians can't have strategy sessions without referring to this. It's become so ubiquitous. Um, and social media has also allowed uh, any number of groups to demonize each other. Uh, and to um, to be bad bad actors and 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 get away with things that we never dreamt possible. I, I think even five or or ten years ago. Uh, and so what happens is mistrust goes up between between all the groups, um, and then walls go up. And you have politicians like Donald Trump, like Doug Ford in the early days, deciding that the best strategy is just to shut the media out uh, completely and try to get their message out. Through more, um, through more direct means, um, and and the problem with that is is that that that's not good for for anybody. So on the media side, I can shed a little bit of light on on what's been happening in newsrooms over the last few years. So media organizations used to have one kind of key question that they would ask before they decided to do a story or jump on something or pursue something. And that's this, is, is this story in the public interest? So is, for example, someone misusing public funds? It, is there a hypocrisy here by a powerful person that needs to be called out? Is there uh, accountability that, that needs to be uh, brought to play because somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing. Somebody's not following the rules. The rules aren't being implemented the way they're meant to be. Um, and 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 that was sort of how the media operated for the, for the most part. Um, but what's happened recently is more and more media outlets, in the pursuit of the almighty dollar, in pursuit at, at the same time as page views, which equal the almighty dollar, they're asking a different question. They're asking this question instead, which is, is the public interested in this? And that's how they're deciding what, what to do stories on. And if you look at those two things, they look very similar, right? They're both about the public, they're both about being interested. But the second one, um, it's, the public's interested in a lot of things. The public's interested, and I can tell you from looking at the clicks and the page views, they're interested in, you know, nudity. They're interested in celebrities. They're interested in sex scandals and dancing bears. There's all kinds of things that, as a media organization, you can choose to dedicate resources and energy to. Um, but it's important to understand, and we ask ourselves this all the time, that these two things are not equal. They're they're not the same, um, and you know media has kind of lost its way a little bit. You, you you see even sort of the legacy media outlets spending a lot more time on things to draw people in, so that they will then read about the first one here, which is the things that are in the public interest. So um, it's it's a difficult difficult time, and there's other pressures as well. Does that what I mean? Yeah, those pressures uh, look like a bit of a chaotic sort of um, media environment. So, for example, media has to file 24-7. That is something that uh, was not the case before, right? So with the internet, the audience is available all the time. A news cycle used to be 24 hours and it went down to 12 hours. Now you're lucky if you can call a news cycle one hour. Uh, that's a new thing. Uh, also, we went from, in the 1970s, the average soundbite being something around 43 seconds uh, to, by the time we get to the 90s, it drops down to nine seconds. 
but it gets worse. It gets worse, especially when you go on to the social media universe. So you have a broadcast story that can try to fit in all the complexities of one issue in three to six minutes. That's not a lot of time. Uh, but if you try to reduce that story to say a Snapchat format or an Instagram format, now you're looking at two to three panels uh, that can only fit in so much information. So uh, there's a lot of information and the audience is interested in so much. And so the media is kind of split between, uh, you know, the quality stuff, the vegetables that we have to feed the audiences um, and also the things that they kind of want to eat, the maybe celebrity stories that Allison was mentioning just a few minutes ago. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the pressures of the atmosphere that the media is dealing with. Can we jump ahead two slides? Is that possible? Great. So on the political side of things, uh, you've also got politicians responding to the, the environment that Elamine was describing, the, the tight timelines and the short sound bites. So the politicians increasingly go through media training. Um, they, they go through um, mock scrums where they get every question thrown at them that, that they might be likely to encounter. Uh, to, to learn, you know, how to stay on message, but also to learn how to actually avoid answering certain questions. So here's a few of the ways that they avoid answering questions. And after I've told you these, I guarantee you're going to hear these the next time you listen to the radio or watch TV and see somebody being interviewed. So the first one, if we could throw that one up there, is that they deny. They deny the question. They question the premise. They say, you know, well, you've got your facts wrong, or they just flat out refuse to answer. They just say, I'm not going to answer that. I said I was coming on to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about that. So that's the first way. The second way is to deflect. So there's a number of ways of, of doing that. One of them is to go after the interviewer. Uh, again, you know, you've got your facts wrong. What do you think about this? You know, didn't you used to, you know, be on this side of the issue? They use the deflection to make a political point, which is way off of, you know, what the topic was, or they, and you, you'll hear this, it's really obvious, they'll actually attack an opponent. So they're asked about their own policy or their own stance, and they'll, they'll immediately say, yeah, but what about that guy? That sort of whataboutism that we hear so much about. Um, it, what about his position? Why aren't you grilling him about his position? And then the third way is, uh, is distraction. So that is seeming to answer the question, but by repeating an earlier answer, answering an entirely different question, or giving a partial answer. And this one is tricky because it sounds like they're answering a question. And unless you're listening closely and you notice, but the question was actually something else entirely, uh, this one, politicians get away with this all the time, unless the interviewer pulls them back and says, you know, that classic question, with all due respect, you haven't answered my question. And so this becomes a bit of a, I guess I would call it a cat and mouse game where, uh, you know, the, the interviewers are, are asking more pointed questions. The politicians are doing all they can to not answer them and not talk about something else. But the, the big loser here, I guess, and, and this is part of the, the point that we want to make, is the audience, everybody else uh, who aren't getting the information they need uh, out of this encounter, uh, and they're probably not getting the accountability that they want or or that they're looking for. So, it's uh, it's not a great system. So, why do we need to fix this? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. You can get your news from Facebook. You can get your news from social media. You can get your news from celebrity gossip websites, but. It turns out from, from all the polling that's been done, getting a fire hose of information isn't actually how most people like to learn about the world. And it's certainly not a very effective way of informing a population or a citizenry as, as I was talking about earlier. So uh, you can see here that the trust in Facebook's newsfeed has dropped drastically. I think it's even lower than the 18% figure there. Um, but the media, believe it or not, uh, is, especially in Canada, the media is sort of clinging to, to at least some trust uh, of the public. Um, and that's a good thing. And that's, that's sort of a starting point. That's somewhere, somewhere to work from. Um, because 
you know, making us better, the media needs to get better. Um, and I think a lot of us are trying hard to get better. Uh, and I think, I, I think that um, why I love doing this workshop so much, and I tell Jerry this every year, is, uh, is because this is, this is my way to play a small part in, in doing that, in, in trying to expose a little bit about how the media works, but also talk about why it's important that, that the media and politicians um, find a way to, to, to work together in the future. Now, uh, something that we're curious about here is that, you know what, you are news consumers too. Um, you are media consumers too. And we'd like to know what are the kinds of things that frustrate you most as a consumer of media? So there's the aggressive gotcha reporters. Those are, can sometimes be a little uncomfortable to watch. Um, there's evasive politicians. Those make me frustrated because I can just kind of watch and be like, oh, these are all the ways that you're evading answering one question. Um, there's the uninformed reporters and interviewers, and you know what? That does happen. Sometimes you see a reporter who doesn't know, who hasn't done their homework, um, and that can be frustrating to watch. And then lastly, there's unprepared politicians. So let's do some of the polling and let's see what you guys come up with. Allison, which one is your least favorite? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I have found myself being uninformed last minute, sent out the door as a reporter trying to read in the cab and get myself up to speed on a story. So I'll cop to that one. But mm -hmm. I think, I think evasive politicians bother me more than unprepared, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that acutely. What I'm liking is that unprepared politicians among this group is the smallest polling number mm -hmm. so far. Uh, I, I, I assume you guys are like, no politician is ever unprepared. So that can't be a real thing. Oh, just you wait till we play our next example. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It does happen. Should we wrap up the poll here? What do you think? It's been about a minute. Oh, we got 50 people, 50 out of 72 people have voted so far. But evasive politicians is winning, is winning the... I think it's won. Yes, it has completely won. I, I like that, uh, that you guys have some room. Only 14% only of uh, respondents said that aggressive gotcha reporters bother the most. I have a soft spot in my heart for gotcha reporters. I think uh, like there, there's something to be said about the style, even though it could be like a little abrasive. Um, that's sometimes how you get the most interesting thing out of a politician because it's something that they're not ready to answer, um, but it's something they need to answer. That's, you know, that's what an accountability interview is after all. Yeah, great. Thanks you guys for participating. That was awesome. Um, so uh, let's move on. Let's move on to that example I just mentioned uh, uh, about where things can actually go off the rails. And then I'm not. Sh I, we're not showing this just to um, just to make you cringe, although I think you will, uh, or to or to show anybody up. It's so that we can learn from this uh, and learn how to prevent it from happening. So uh, I, I want you to watch this short video clip and pay attention to the numbers that the politician is giving. This this is an interview with a British Labour MP during an election campaign. And she's talking about her party's platform about spending more money on uh, policing, particularly policing in, uh, in London. So let's have a look. Think we're having trouble with the audio? Yes, seems like it. Okay, sorry, one second. Sorry, I didn't want to talk and talk over it if it was working. <laughs> I can't wait till you guys hear the audio from this one. <laughs> How much would 10,000 police officers cost? Well, um, if we recruit the 10,000 police uh, men and women over a four year period, we believe it'll be about 300,000 pounds. 
three hundred thousand pounds for sorry three... ten thousand police officers. What are you saying? Them? <laughs> no, I mean sorry. How much will they cost? They will cost. They will. It will cost um, about about eighty million pounds. About eighty million yeah. pounds. Right. How do you get to that figure? We get to that figure because we anticipate recruiting twenty five thousand police extra police officers a year at least over a period of four years and we're looking at both what average police wages are generally but also specifically police wages in London. I don't understand if you divide 80 million by 10,000 you get 8,000. What we're Is that what you're going to pay these policemen and women? No we're talking about um, uh, an, a, a process over four years. I don't understand. What, what, what is he or she getting? 80 million uh, divided by 10,000 equals 8,000. So, I'd, what are these police officers going to be paid? We will be paying them the average. Has this been thought through? Of course, it's been thought what? through. I love that indignation at the end. Of course, it's been thought through. So this is a classic example of an unprepared politician, uh, and I think uh, I think we're all cringing on on her behalf. And this one, I mean, this is a phone interview. So presumably she's got notes in front of her. She's got an assistant with her, providing her with some some of the information. Um, so let's have a let's have a look at another example now uh, that that illustrates a different issue. Uh, perhaps somebody being too prepared uh, and I'll just tell you who this is. Um, <clears throat> so this is a Republican congressman a few years ago. He was caught on tape at a fundraiser um, uh, talking about, you remember the birther movement around Obama and how Obama was not born in the United States. So th this guy was caught on tape talking about this and then approached by a reporter to explain himself. Let's have a look at that. Only on 9 News tonight, Congressman Mike Kaufman speaks out about his comments that linked him to the birther movement and drew criticism nationwide. Kyle Clark broke the story of Kaufman's speech to fundraisers caught on tape where he said President Obama is not an American at heart. And since last Thursday, we've been asking Congressman Kaufman to explain what he meant and explain why he backed off so quickly, issuing a statement apologizing and saying he misspoke soon after we told his campaign staff that we had it all on tape. Increasing spending. The congressman is usually willing to talk about anything. He's been on 9 News 16 times in the past year, weighing in on everything from wildfires to Memorial Day celebrations. Seems the only thing he didn't want to talk about is what he said at a fundraiser in Elbert County May 12th. I don't know whether Barack Obama was born in the United States or not. I don't know that. But I do know this, that it is hard. He's not an American. He's just not an American. Home this week on recess, Congressman Kaufman is lying low, sending aides to his events in his place and ignoring our request for an interview. So we caught up with him outside a closed door fundraiser tonight. Take a look at the raw, unedited video of our conversation. I apologize for showing up unannounced. I've been trying to call your staff. They won't return my phone calls. So let me ask you, after your comments about the president, do you feel that voters are owed a better explanation than just, I misspoke? I think that, um, as I, I stand by my statement, uh, that I misspoke and I apologize. Okay, and who are you apologizing to? You know, I stand by my statement that I misspoke and I apologize. I apologize. We talk to you all the time. You're a very forthcoming guy. Who's telling you not to talk and to handle you it know, like I, this? I stand by my statement that I wrote, that you have, and I misspoke and I apologize. Was it that you thought it would go over well in Elbert County where folks are very conservative and you'd never say something like that in the suburbs? I stand by my statement that I misspoke and I apologize. Is there anything that I can ask you that you'll answer differently? You know, I stand by my statement that I misspoke and I apologize. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. There's your classic nine second sound, but I don't even think it was nine seconds, Elamine. No, it is not. It is five words, and he's wearing those five words like a suit of armor. I stand by my statement. <laughs> I misspoke, and I apologize. 
And uh, you know what, like, let's get to the next slide so we can talk about what politicians can do in these moments, because that was clearly, those videos are, are, are two ends of the same train wreck in the sense that, you know, in the first example, you saw someone who was completely uh, unprepared. So she was not prepared at all. Um, one thing you can do is, is be prepared. That is really not a big ask in the grand scheme of things. It should be the lowest bar that there, that there is available. But in that second example, you can be too prepared in the sense that someone just gave you a sentence to repeat, to repeat, and you're not a real person. You're just sort of spouting this thing without being authentic. So that's the other thing you can do is, is, is be authentic um, and, and, and be present in the interview and talk like a human being. Um, and I think if you, if you do those two things, like the worst that can happen is not that bad versus becoming a YouTube sensation that ends up being, you know, used in presentations just like this one. Uh, so I want to play you uh, another clip um, because I want I want to shed a bit a bit more light on that behind the scenes that we were talking about about what journalists and interviewers are thinking about from our side of the microphone. Uh, so you may you may recognize this man, a, one of the most famous interviewers ever, Larry King, had a talk show on CNN for for 25 some odd years. He's written lots of books, um, and so this is a clip of him talking about how he treats and how he uh, how he thinks of politicians. Let me play that one. Start now. Barry Goldwater and George McGovern had no cutoff between the brain and the mouth. Yeah. You ask them a question, they answer it, right? Wiped out in national yeah. elections because the public and the, we, we in the media say, we want direct honesty, and then we lambast you if you're directly honest. So what the politician tries to do is, how can I say something? And the best tip, anybody, if you're watching an interview show with a politician mm -hmm. and the a guest is asked the question and the politician says, I'm glad you asked that. Here's the truth. He is totally not glad you asked that. <laughs> and he has said, I'm glad you asked that. So he can think of how to answer it that will appeal to the largest common denominator. So I'm guessing you probably heard that about four billion times four in, billion in 25 times. years on CNN. But and you, now still, you do the best you can. What I try to do is get at the core of things. I try to ask good questions, come around in a lot of ways. But I, on the other hand, I have great respect for politicians for this reason. They do something that we don't do. One, they stand up and be counted. Mm -hmm. And they have what we have never had in our lives. They have a Tuesday in November where the score goes up. And we don't do that. Oh, we have ratings, but that's sporadic. Right. The score goes up. So I've always respected politicians and athletes. Yeah, I love that clip because um, it offers kind of a pretty gentle mea culpa uh, when it comes to the media, at least in terms of like our shortcomings. And I think uh, one thing that the media can do a little bit more of is, is first of all, acknowledge our shortcomings. Because one thing we can do as, as an institution is just show our cards a little bit better. We can be upfront about the information that we want and why it's important to the public that we show it. Um, that's, a, that's ultimately what we're here to do. We're here to seek information. Uh, that is not, um, at the end of the day, it's not a complicated task. Um, and, and, and if we're more upfront about it, I think there would be a better relationship there. Um, but that also means repairing trust by showing that we're not here to be confrontational. Uh, so that is not the, the be all end all of the media universe. Certainly those um, confrontational interviews play better, they share better. Um, but at the end of the day, like they're not really like necessarily in the service of the public any more than an interview that is sort of calm and connect uh, and, and collected and, and, and thoughtfully explores um, what the public needs to know. So with that in mind, um, we're going to move on to the next survey question, which is what's the top thing you'd like to see change about political coverage? Uh, your options are you need, we need more time given for conversations about issues um, or maybe maybe it's time that we stop this idea of the media being a one-way street and more ability for the audience themselves to ask questions. Um, or maybe you're frustrated about the balance in the coverage. What's, what's the thing you'd like to see change about, about uh, political coverage? Let us know in the poll. I 
to say I thought the balance issue would come up, but I think that's just because I spend a lot of time responding to audience complaints at the CBC. <laughs> you do. You have a slightly <laughs> distorted view of, of that. I do. Yeah. I, I do. Although I always figure if you're being accused roughly equally of favoring all the parties, <laughs> you're probably yeah. doing a good job. Uh, that's what balance so I, generally I take, looks like. Yeah, I take comfort from that. Yeah. More time being given for conversations about issues is sort of the, the, the leading option here um, by a lot. Uh, Alison, what are, what are some of the limitations in terms of like trying to give more time to a single issue? Yeah, well, uh, people's attention span, I would say. Yeah. I mean, we do, we have, we do minute by minute ratings uh, in, in broadcasts. We can see the exact moment that people turn away I, I, that's, that's why I've never wanted to be a TV anchor. You know, you can see the moment at which people lose interest in, in you and your face and what people are saying. Um, radio isn't quite as precise in, in measuring that, but you know, working in online, uh, Elamine, you, you can see how far down the story people read. I mean, that's gotta be a blow to the, the ego. People, people don't seem to have time. And yet you look at polls like this and they want more depth. They want more. Space. They do. I, and I, I never know what to do about that because like there's a craving for the depth. Um, but then sometimes when you give that depth, you know, a, a smaller percentage of the audience might stick around for it. And it's like, what is the trade off that you're willing to sort of forgo here? Yeah, I love just a little sidebar. I love what sites like Axios and uh, even The Guardian are doing, which give you options to read the super short version and then do a drop down and dig, dive deeper if you're interested. So Axios does the bullet points at the top. And yeah. then if you want more, you can click on the actual story. So yeah, yeah. So that, it's like a recognition of like how people are consuming, how different people consume, you know, different news. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, we've got one more short clip to play for you before we get to our uh, guinea pigs, I mean, volunteers uh, <laughs> in doing the interview. So, uh, you'll recognize this fellow, uh, Boris Johnson. This was back when he was the mayor of London and he was being grilled, which is fascinating to watch this clip now, uh, by the media over whether he wanted to be the prime minister. Uh, and uh, he was dithering and he didn't want to answer. So what we're going to see here is part of an interview where he's being quizzed. And then you get this interesting thing where he's asked afterwards about the interview and he kind of sheds some light on his own thinking. So I love this because you see the thing and then you get to see Boris kind of talking and thinking about his perspective afterwards. Let's have a look. But, no. but do you want to be prime minister? Say it. Well, Say what it. I want is for David Cameron yeah. uh, to win this election, of course, uh, which he deserves to do. Do you want? To and be uh, I want to. I want to do everything I possibly can to help. And in and in those circumstances, <laughs> it is completely nonsensical okay. uh, for me to, go to for me to indulge. You know this increasingly um, hysterical. You could end it all just nothing. by saying what you know to be true. What that I don't want to. That you want well, to that, be prime minister. You cannot be too hard on on politicians. It is the function of BBC journalists to uh, to bash up uh, politicians, particularly people like me. And uh, so I don't. I, I think you know I should have realised that, that they were going to want to talk about all this old stuff. I my head was full of facts and figures about housing in London and what we were doing with Olympic legacy, and I was all I was all primed to to spiel about that. Unfortunately, I was I was not good on the the detail of stuff that happened in my life about people, 20 years ago. People say that's, that's a problem with you. You're not good on the detail. Well, no, no. I, I, I was, if, if I'd been asked about housing in London, if I'd been asked about Olympic legacy, uh, or the, the things that I really wanted to, to talk about, then, then I could have gone on uh, for hours. But, but I sh I, anyway, fair play to Eddie. You know, he landed a, he, he landed a good one. And, and, and that is, but that, you know, if the BBC can't bash Tory politicians, what is the point of the BBC? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so we're going to move on now uh, into our interview role playing uh, and we're going to get you to listen for some certain things as we move into these uh, interviews and we're going to do two interviews. I'm going to do one uh, with one of our volunteers and then Elamine will do a different one uh, and in each of them um, the volunteer will be playing uh, a politician. So in the first one uh, they'll be playing the Ontario Education Minister, and in the second one, they'll be playing the BC Health Minister, just to give you some 
some context there, but this is what we want you to, um, to be listening for. So um, do they sound authentic? Do they sound prepared? We're gonna keep hammering away on those two things. If you remember nothing from our presentation today, it's say, be authentic, be prepared. Um, and do they seem relaxed and happy to be there? I and mean, probably not, because this is happening in front of all of you, but, uh, but, uh, but maybe, maybe they'll be able to, to be relaxed. I mean, that, that takes quite a bit of practice, I will say, in, for politicians to feel so completely comfortable. So our first interview subject uh, I would like to introduce um, is Catherine Rankin. And do we see Catherine there? Catherine works for the BC Health Services Authority. Sorry, I reversed those two. We're talking BC first and then we're talking Ontario. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Catherine works for the BC Health Services Authority, supporting transgender, diverse, and two-spirit people. She's a PhD in interdisciplinary oncology from UBC, and she has completed the Institute for Future Leaders back in 2018, back in the day. But today, she's playing the role of BC's health minister, Adrienne Dix. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Are you, is Catherine with us? I don't see her on my screen. I'm here. Hello. Oh, there you are. Oh, you have to speak for me to see you. There we go. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks uh, so for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so I'm going to read a short introduction, uh, and then I'm going to launch into some questions. Just so everyone knows, uh, Catherine has had some background, so she knows generally the topic that we're going to be talking about. This isn't a complete blind side expecting her to pull facts and figures out of thin air, so just so everyone knows. Okay, BC is often held up as the example of how to flatten a COVID curve. But now questions are being asked about the follow through, and in particular, the next potential wave of the disease. Long term care homes have been at the epicenter of outbreaks and deaths from COVID, and some are saying now that not enough is being done to ensure that they are being made safer. Minister of Health Adrienne Dix joins us now to discuss. Good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Allison. You've ordered up some better practices at, at long-term care homes. Can, can talk a bit about what, about what you're doing there. Sure, yeah. Um, so we've been working with our partners in labor with the BC Care Providers Association uh, to ensure that there are plans in place uh, at these different long-term care homes. Um, we're really committed to ensuring that people are able to um, feel safe in their homes. Uh, no matter uh, whether or not they're young or if they're an elder person. And so we're committing uh, $165 million over the course of um, the next little while uh, so that we can hire 2,040 staff. Um, that's about three staff on average per, per care home. Uh, and we're also putting in place a number of guidelines based on the direction from Dr. Bonnie Henry. Um, and so visits will need to be booked in, in advance. Uh, folks will need to be required to wear a mask if they want to visit with, um, with a resident at one of these care homes. And it will be limited to one person per uh, resident. Uh, and we're, we're also designating sites within these homes as well. I want to come back to the visits in a moment, um, mm -hmm. but it's just come out that hardly any of these homes have actually been inspected yet to make sure that these policies are being put in place? I mean, what's the point of regulations if you're not following up on them? Well, you know, we have, um, we, we already have 318 out of 681 homes that have a plan in place, or have submitted plans to government, I should say. And we're, um, we're working with, as I say, those folks at the BC Care Providers Association with um, the folks that run the long-term care homes to ensure that they have a good plan in place. We, we know that we can't rush this. Um, we're, and I mean, I also want to note that I really want to send my deepest condolences to all the families that have lost a loved one uh, in our long-term care homes. And I think that those families would really want to know that if we're going to allow visitations to happen, uh, it would be a disrespect, disrespectful to their memory if we were to uh, rush this. And so we're really trying to take our time and as I say, uh, ensure that each home has a really good plan in place before uh, we open this up. That, that is a tough line that you're walking because on the other hand, you've got all those people who haven't been able to visit their family members in a care home and, and, and really not understanding why this isn't sorted out. Long-term care homes, we've known that they're, they're a problem. We, we know that, 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 that there's still going to be people there that people want to visit. 
Um, why isn't this why isn't this done? Um, you know, I think that we, as you kind of described, there, there, there's a fine line here. We have to respect the fact that um, we have to do this in a really safe way, but we also have to recognize that socially isolating seniors uh, has a long-term health impact as well on their health. Um, and so, as I say, I think we're, we're working with our provincial health officer. We're working with um, a lot of the folks on the ground in the Ministry of Health, and we're really trying to, as I say, get those um, those staff into in, hired at these long care long term care homes, so that we have folks that are there when a, a visitor comes into the home, so that they actually are briefed on proper PPE use and um, what the regulations are. Because if that doesn't happen, we you know we don't want certain homes you know maybe that have a little bit that are a little bit better resourced to be able to put a plan in place and everything's hunky dory. But we also you know. We're mindful that some, a lot of care homes don't have those resources and we have to step up and ensure that they're able to uh, maintain safety as well. We just have a, a couple of seconds left, but um, this is the one area where I think every government has, has stumbled a bit in terms of trust to the public. How are you going to get that back? I think that, um, you know, we've, uh, I think we've drawn a really good line here, a really good balance, I should say in terms of uh, trying to uh, open up our economy, ensuring, as I say, that people get that social connection that they need, but also really being mindful that um, <gasps> people want to feel safe in their, in their home. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll be monitoring all of this on an ongoing basis, really trying to ensure that, uh, you know, if something changes, that we can adapt. But uh, this decision, these decisions affect all of us, many of us, have parents and grandparents in long-term care. And so I think none of us want to get this wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your time today. Thank you very much. Elamine? That was a delight. <laughs> I, I was watching that be like, I love all of these answers. If I was listening to this, I would be comforted as a listener, as a citizen. Um, that, those were well-prepared answers in, in, in the sense that like you weren't reaching for anything too far, you know, like none of it, none of it felt evasive to me. Um, I was like, wow, Allison's being really tough, but, um, but, but Catherine's unshakable here. Totally unflappable. That was great. Yeah, that, that was great. Your, your answers were prepared and authentic. You were very good. Um, and just so everyone knows, uh, Catherine did not have the questions in advance. I should have said that too. Um, lest anyone think, based on that, <laughs> that she did, because that was that was uh, that was very good. You uh, and you didn't get rattled even when the questions were were kind of pointier. So, uh, well done, Catherine. Good job. Thank you so much. I forgot to note that Isabel McKenzie, the BC Seniors Advocate, likes our plan as well. <laughs> nice. I love, uh, I love a prepared politician. Mm. Uh, we're doing the second scenario right now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So up next, I'd like to introduce Nicole ofue Bunet. She's a senior management consultant working to support Canada's innovation economy and communities. Nicole has an MA in public administration from the University of, of Ottawa, and she completed the Institute for Future Leaders at Ryerson in 2019, you know, way back 3,000 years ago before the pandemic. Uh, now today, Nicole has agreed to play the role of Ontario Minister of Education, Stephanie Lecce. Uh, Nicole, are you in here? Maybe. Yes, I can't hear you though. Not yet. We'll give you a couple of seconds. It says connecting audio, so we'll give it a couple of seconds. I will go very easy. I'm no, I'm no Alison Brottle, I'll tell you that.
still says connecting, hey? It does say connecting, yeah. Yeah, I feel optimistic about that. Maybe try disconnecting, Meg, uh, Nicole, and reconnecting. It might get you. She's not hearing anything at all now. No. Yeah. Hmm. Wonder if she's talking any, something in the chat. Were there any comments in the chat on the last interview? I wonder. I see some chat was in there, but I don't know if it was about the interview. Oh yeah, there was plenty. Uh, a lot of people said comfortable. Uh, uh, comments like comfortable, prepared, and well done, very authentic. And she's an alumni for can a reason. Yes, oh, totally can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> no worries at all. Are you Are okay. you ready? I am ready. Thank you so much. Nice all to right. be here. Welcome. I'll read the short intro, and then after that, you will be for a brief moment the Minister of Education for the Great Province of Ontario. All right. As the province of Ontario slowly reopens different sectors and in different regions, there is still uncertainty around what classrooms and schools will look like come September. As various hybrid plans are being worked on, parents are just expressing all kinds of frustration and anger as they struggle to plan work and childcare. Joining us now is Ontario's Minister of Education, Stephanie Lecce. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Elman. <laughs> Minister, why are there so many options for back to school when the best thing for parents would be just some certainty? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of Ontario's youth, uh, the, our extended families and the parents as well, um, for doing their best that they can during this unusual school year. Our ministry uh, continues to work with partners to really understand uh, the changes that we need to make to ensure that our school system uh, can really keep up. So regarding the plan to reopen our schools uh, this fall, the health and safety of Ontario's children um, really is our number one priority. In addition to maintaining a standard of education that will equip our children with the skills and knowledge that they require to uh, really succeed in today's ever-changing world, um, you know, safety for all our stakeholders is a key guiding principle. So this means that as we think through the three various scenarios, we really want to ensure that um, we're, we're, we're taking a prudent approach, if you will. We want to have the time to work with all stakeholders and really bring to bear uh, the various and diverse uh, opinions and viewpoints um, that are really important to consider as we move to reopen schools in a safe uh, manner. So time is really uh, something that we want to continue to sort of use uh, and ensure that we're adopting a prudent decision. Minister, I hear you. These are complicated matters that take a long time to, to sort of figure out. But, but, but it's, it, is, it is July and, parents, and these children go back to school in September and parents are saying they just need a plan. So why not consult with each school board and then just figure out what those individual plans are? So what's been really helpful um, right now is that we've been working with the school boards actually to understand their viewpoints and understand uh, the requirements in order to ensure that we do open schools safely. Uh, you know, <laughs> the coronavirus pandemic is unpredictable. Uh, it's really forced us to jettison tradition and adapt. Uh, in order to do that, we have to consider what would make uh, schools safe for children as we reopen and fall. But we also have to remain uh, flexible. Now, I, you, you don't have children yourself. You don't have children in school yourself. How are you able to sort of will, you know, a, a relationship to these parents? How are you able to relate to, to the parents in this situation? So that's a great question. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that whether we have a young family now or in the future, it's really important to be plugged into the changes uh, and the societal changes, excuse me, uh, that are impacting today's youth and really consider how we have to realign and reassess uh, our priorities in unrolling an education plan that works for everyone. So when we think about Ontario children, our, their, our future is in their hands, but it's also in ours. 
So I've actually, you know, graduated from St. Margaret Mary Catholic Elementary School in Vaughan, Ontario. I was excited to achieve the honor of being an Ontario scholar, but I also have family members that participate in the Ontario education school system. So they're directly impacted by my decisions. So, you know, I'm an unabashed and unapologetic defender of Ontario's education um, school system, and I'm versed in what is working and, and what changes we need to apply to the school system. So, you know, working with a diverse group of stakeholders and taking on diverse opinions is something that I excel at. So uh, it's something that I look forward to doing in my role as Minister of Education. Minister, I hear your enthusiasm for the role of being Minister of Education, but what I don't hear is the anxiety that parents are facing uh, when they think about what they're going to do with their children in September. I, I, can, you, can you see their perspective? So what's been really interesting is the work that we have uh, done on the plan. And I, I am happy to say that in a few weeks, actually, in a, a very short time period, we will have a plan in place and we will be able to share you know, uh, through a public announcement, exactly what the scenario will look like. In, earlier, you alluded to the fact that we have three scenarios. The reason being we, is that we have to maintain a contingency plan if uh, for, you know, we're, we hope it doesn't happen, but if the coronavirus takes a, an unfortunate turn, like I said, the coronavirus pandemic has been unpredictable. So we need to remain agile, reassess as we go, and, and, and just be prepared. Now, some are suggesting that your government is putting more energy into opening bars and opening patios than it is to figure out how to open these schools safely. How does that seem fair to you? So I, in just in talking with my colleagues, I know that they've done the research and analysis required to ensure that if restaurants and bars open, we're doing it in a safe manner. There were some areas where it was um, deemed uh, possible to open up, we were ready. Uh, it met the readiness test. But one thing I wanna mention is that individuals can opt into social activities at restaurants and bars. But when we think about our children, they can't opt out of school. Education is so important. So while other sectors may have opened, there's still an opportunity to opt into those. When we open our schools, we have to be sure that the safety of our children uh, can be, can be um, guaranteed. And so that's what we're thinking about. That is our main guiding principle. Thank you for your time, Minister Lecce. Thank you. Another fantastic performance. You guys aren't guinea pigs at all. <laughs> <laughs> Those are really good answers, really good, uh, thoughtful. Um, I have to say the first answer I felt was going somewhere else and wasn't quite answering the question, but then you pulled it back uh, and you did answer the question. So I thought, I thought that was good. You made the point you wanted to make and then, and then you answered the question. Um, I wasn't watching the chat to see if there was any other uh, feedback. I'll have a look there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, amazing job. Well done, Nicole. Prepared, <laughs> authentic and friendly. Oh, good. Like, like the personal touch about your high school. I liked how you worked in Stephen Lecce's high school into, into your own narrative yeah. there. Yeah, it was well done. <laughs> good. I was like, that is research to prepare for this. That's good. Great. How did you feel, Nicole? Uh, I thought it was interesting. The questions were rapid fire. And although I did have the background information that was shared with me, thank you so much, because it did help uh, me prepare. So... Uh, that was helpful. But yes, it was very rapid fire. And, and to your point, I, I didn't want to stray uh, so much from the question that was being answered, because I, I was really trying not to be evasive. Uh, but then I sort of wanted to uh, sort of present this idea that I was prepared as a politician, and that I wanted to be authentic and really share as much information as possible to really sort of meet that job of informing the public uh, about our, our approach and our plan. Great. Well, thank you again for participating. Um, if you we could put the, the presentation back up, that would be great. Yes. Megan, thank you. We're going to try to zoom through this part of it, social media, aren't we?
Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Uh, so we'll just re reiterate our advice in case you didn't get it from the eight times we've said it uh, about being prepared uh, and being authentic. Uh, and I just want to pick up on something Larry King said. Uh, you know, when he said the, the politician says, I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, he said, often you say that because you're not glad that the question was asked, but you can use little tricks in an interview. Nicole mentioned it felt very rapid fire. You can use little pacing devices. You can, you can say, that's a good question. You can say, well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this and here's where I'm at. It, that can help in sounding authentic. So I just wanted to, to point that out, that, that it doesn't have to be question ends and then boom, you're right into the policy statement or the facts and the figures. It's, it's okay to sound like you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think some of the best interviews that I've watched have been uh, in, in some senses, sort of like attentions of pace, you know, like what an interviewer wants to take into a certain pace and the subject is like, we're not going to go there. I'm going to take sort of my time with the pacing of answering these questions. It can actually make for very entertaining, uh, good television without, without it seeming too awkward because everybody comes off as like authentic and doing their best in, that, in those moments. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds more like a conversation, right? Yes. Which is kind of what we're aiming for. So let's move on now because we just want to talk uh, about uh, a different kind of media other yes. than the traditional interview-based or reporter-based uh, one, and that, Elamine, is social media. It is social media. It is um, the big thing that has changed the way that most newsrooms do everything, but also most politicians do everything. Um, some of the major pros of social media is that you can directly talk to the public. You don't have to wait for a mediator the way that you used to, right? You don't have to wait for a reporter who's going to interpret in certain ways or like um, maybe cut out certain things that you said that you really wanted to deliver. You can directly say that to people. Um, and also it could show that human side of you. You can be pretty funny on social media. The expectations of the medium are that you sort of be a bit loose and can't be very formal. You know, politicians who are very formal um, don't tend to do very well on social media. And you can reach younger people who, for example, you may not have been able to reach in the same way. Um, the cons though, is that when you're bad at it, you can be very bad at it. Um, you, and then you will be, you know, people will let you know that you are not great at social media. That could be anything from um, being mocked um, and being turned into a meme. And this happens to a politician, you know, RIP, like once, once, a, once a week, and you're like, that's them. That's, they're now this meme for, for forever. Um, but you can be misinterpreted. That is also very easy to do. And you can't really correct yourself very well in a, you know, um, in a short tweet. Um, and from, from time to time, if your followers tend in a certain direction, you can start to be linked with some unsavory people that you may not necessarily want associated with you. Um, you don't really have control over that. So let's look at a couple of examples here where social media went wrong. So the first one is from the UK, instead of a tribute to Blockbuster, the founder of Blockbusters, we've got a typo here. Uh, blackbusters and that you know offended some people but also got uh, a lot of mockery going uh, mm -hmm. the one in the middle uh, was a liberal candidate who decided to take a, a swing at the cancer society saying that it was an outlet for big pharma well that didn't go over so well not with the public and not with uh, the campaign organizers and so she wasn't a candidate anymore um, and then the last one here, you may have seen, uh, this came from Peter McKay's account, a conservative politician, uh, and, and took a swing at Justin Trudeau and his yoga budget. Um, that was immediately dismissed on social media as being petty and trivial, and McKay ended up blaming it on a staff member and distancing himself from it, which is also not a good look. Yes, your staffer may be helping you run your account, but really you should be looking, uh, you should be looking at what's going out there and you should be willing to own what's going out there. Um, I, I, I didn't take the easy route here and include uh, any tweets from one Donald J. Trump because that's just gone into the absurd and I don't think makes much of a point for regular politicians anymore. So what should we be thinking about Elamine when, when we're using social media? Well, I think there's three main questions to sort of ask yourself. The first question is, is it worth it? Um, not every politician 
needs to be on social media. Like you don't, not everybody needs to be on every platform. You don't have to say, oh my God, I'm a politician. Young people are on TikTok. Do I need a TikTok? You might not need it. Um, you sort of have to ask yourself, how many people are you reaching and what are you getting out of it? Um, second question, it's kind of a big question, which is, is there risk? Uh, that means you have to sit down and figure out all the things that can go wrong and figure out ways to mitigate against them. So in the case of Peter McKay, there have been several tweets that end up getting roundly sort of mocked. Um, and like, that is a risk. That is a risk that he has to take. And like, I, I don't know if they factored into, you know, the strategy, um, all the things that could go wrong. And then the last thing is, is there a better way to get the point across? Sometimes a, a point isn't a tweet. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a press release. Sometimes it is um, a radio conversation. Uh, have you checked your wording? Uh, will it really work on social media or will there be a reaction that you can't, like you're not anticipating? Um, so sometimes asking yourself what's a better way to get a, this point across is a really valuable question instead of just being like, oh, this is, you know, I should just do everything on social media and therefore this also belongs um, on social media. So we got uh, a couple of quick scenarios we're gonna run through here. The first one is, a, is a, what would you do? This is our next survey question. So there's a Me Too accusation against one of your running mates in a provincial election that has surfaced on social media. You've worked on several gender equity initiatives with him and therefore are connected publicly. He's denying detail of the incident but allows that other people may experience or remember events in their own way. So here are your options. What do you do? Do you support him wholeheartedly? Do you distance yourself from him immediately? Or do you issue a general statement about needing to consider all sides and refrain from reacting too quickly? And then the last option is, do you do nothing? Do you do nothing at all? Uh, we're gonna put that up on the survey questions. Let's see what people... I love that the first first answer was a do nothing. Do, do nothing. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, which is which was your third point there, which was do I need to be is there a better place for me to be other than on this platform at this time? <laughs> yep. Yes, exactly. No one is supporting their colleague here. <laughs> That's a zero percent for support. Yeah. Well, I guess wholeheartedly. That's Right, that could be it. Yeah, it looks like the a general, general statement. statement. Yeah, a general statement, and that that I would say is the safest option. If it is. if you're not going with do nothing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it's tricky. I mean, distancing yourself from people immediately. Is it interesting when you watch some of the stuff that happened in the States uh, with Me Too and Al Franken and the politicians who ran screaming from him immediately, that's actually come back to backfire on some of those, um, some of those female politicians. So interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I like the issuing the general statement though. That's, that's a pretty safe bet. Yeah. Should we go to the next one? Let's do it. So another, what would you do? During an election campaign, a reporter at your community newspaper discovers some photos of, on Facebook of you. You're at your university residence, you're wearing just your underwear and you're clearly drunk. No, nope, that would never happen. Uh, the reporter phones to let you know these photos are gonna be appearing on the paper's website and on the front page of the next edition, asks if you want to comment. What do you do? Do you say no comment and hope that kills the story? Do you try to talk her out of doing the story? Do you own it and try to put a positive spin on it? Here's the survey. Thoughts? Oh, positive wow. spin out of the gate. It's not even oh. close. Yeah. I like the brave soul who would try to talk her out of doing the story. <laughs> you know, I I'm curious if we'd ask this same question even two or three years ago, or in the last election cycle, I wonder if people would have been as positive or confident about that positive spin. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. That's a that's a big shift, um, especially like I guess like from our last election um, after having some sort of embarrassing pictures of of the prime minister surface when he was of him being younger. Um, it does set a different tone, doesn't it? It changes kind of the table stakes of this. 
Yeah, because owning it can include apologizing for it, right? Yes. In the instance that you're talking about, right? Um, uh, so I, th I think that ap acceptance of apologies and that, you know, I've learned from it, that kind of messaging, I think is much more prevalent these days than, as I say, even two, three, four years ago, when something like this could knock you out of the running. Um, yes. That it, it just would. And I should just say, um, you would not be able to talk a reporter out of doing this story. Um, you, you could try and say it wasn't in the public interest, but you're running for public office and I think you would have a very hard time. So I, I think that would, that would be a tricky one to try to pull off. So let's just reiterate our questions. Yes. Before you hit send <laughs> <laughs> on anything, ask yourself these three questions. Uh, is it worth it? Is there risk? And there may be risk, but it may be something you can mitigate or work around. And then is there a better way to get your point across? Uh, Twitter is not everything. Thank <laughs> God. Twitter is not. Not everyone's on Twitter. No. no. Nobody's Most people on aren't Twitter. on Twitter. Only yes. journalists are on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. And politicians. Yeah. Journalists and politicians talk to each other in a loop. What a, yeah. what a life. So we've got some time for questions now before the session wraps up. Um, I don't know if there's already been some coming in or if they're coming in, trickling in now. I've got some now. You can all hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All right. Um, thanks so much, Allison and Elamine. That was great. Um, and thanks to Nicole and Catherine for agreeing to be part of this. <laughs> Being put on the hot seat. Uh, you did an amazing job. Um, so moving on to the Q&A, um, I have a couple questions from the chat and some that have been sent to me directly. The first is from Abdul and he asks, how would one deal with a journalist who seems to be more of an ideologue than a journalist? <laughs> Good question. So a journalist with an agenda, a journalist who seems to be taking another point of view, I'm, I'm going to assume is, is, is what you mean by that. Um, I think all you can do is answer the questions as legitimately and kind of openly as as you can manage. Um, I, I think there is not much advantage in trying to call the journalist out, particularly in a live interview or or in a scrum situation. That's that's going that's going to be tricky, and it will make you look like you're just trying to avoid answering the questions. So um, it's tough. Uh, it's it's tough because it can get your back up um, and you you know you can feel that it's not fair um, but I, my advice would be just kind of stick to your guns stick to your um, you know your understanding of the issue and um, take it from there yeah sounds about right <laughs> okay move on to the next one this question comes from Lisa um, is there training, I'm assuming she means an, in anti-racism, indigenous rights, and in, uh, is that important for media and journalists? I notice many journalists and media outlets have limited understanding and it shows in how they write and speak about indigenous issues, racism calls for justice, truth and reconciliation commission calls for action. It can be shocking sometimes to see some of the reporting. So I've, I've been uh, a journalist for about uh, nine years or so and in those nine years I've probably gone through at least three or four uh, four four anti-racism workshops the content of those workshops has changed because our our understanding as a society of, of, of racism and anti-racism has also changed my guess is that a workshop that I took two years ago is not going to be you know um, has have the same content uh, as it would this year um, so, what I would say is that like there are lots of newsrooms that are being proactive about this. Um, it also is a little bit impossible for every newsroom to keep up with all of it all the time. Um, I think the best way to, to sort this out is that through the accountability measures that are already available. Um, so, in the case of the CBC, for example, there's an ombudsman um, and Allison was fill in ombudsman, what, a couple of weeks ago, um, where you were answering um, emails from people saying, hey, I have a problem with, with your coverage of this. Hey, I have a problem with your understanding of this. Uh, it's an evolving conversation. And I think like the day that media companies say, oh, we did it, we've learned everything there is to learn. That's when they start to sort of get in trouble. 
Um, so, but I, but I would say, yes, it's an evolving thing. So, and like some organizations are better at keeping up with it than others. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree. I, I, I've also been through um, a, a lot of training uh, on, on this front, but um, it, that's only a tiny piece of it. The, the bigger piece of it is we need more diversity in, in our media organizations. We, we need more people with different perspectives and um, from different backgrounds and of different colors sitting around the table and particularly in the decision making chairs. Um, you know, the CBC spends a lot of time talking about how many diverse employees we have, but when you drill down, many, many of them are at the entry level positions. They're associate producers, they're researchers, they're not the president, they're not the assignment editor, they're not, um, uh, you know, the, the key decision makers. And that, to I'll be totally frank with, with you, that's the work that needs to be done and, and is being done. And so, I take the, the point, I take the, the criticism in, inherent in the question there, I totally to heart, you're absolutely right, and we need to do better, we need to, we need to get better at that, and the, the way we do that is by changing the makeup of who's sitting at the table. Great, um, we have another question from the chat from Shiva. Um, can you recommend any books that clearly show anyone how they can be effective in media relations and be honest at the same time? Hmm. Books. Hmm. Books. Hey, I mentioned Larry King earlier. I think his book is called How to Talk to Anyone About Anything or something like that. But Larry King for sure is the author. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers. I, I learned a lot from, uh, from that book. And that's, you know, the, the beauty of that is it makes you better at conversation in general, I think, as well as being, being better uh, in, in interviews. Um, I think, I'm just trying to think. Elamine, do you know any actual books? Uh, I, I was like, the first thing that came to mind was I was going to recommend some YouTube compilations of uh, just like totally crash and burn um, interviews. I'm saying, don't do that, which is not the most valuable advice. But I would say like one of the best books that I've read about, not just political communication, but just communication in general, um, is Thomas Counterman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's just a really good book that gets at the heart of like how we trigger certain ways of engaging with what you just said. Um, and like, if you spend just like, I don't know, just like a good week with that book, you'll come out of it just like with an entirely different understanding of uh, the way that certain messages are communicated to you um, and, and how you respond to them. So thinking fast and slow is just a, just a broader recommendation. Great, let me grab another question from the chat. This comes from Victoria. Um, Despite knowing the adverse effects of social media, does the politician still feel the pressure to use it out of fear of appearing to not be engaging? Is it really easy to refuse using it when everybody else is using it? Oh, great question. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends on what you have to do on the platform to begin with. Like there certainly are politicians who are not on social media or they have accounts, they have profiles. Um, but like their job on those profiles is simply to just to like retweet what their party does or, you know, like tweet out announcements. It's very much like a, they use it like a broadcast platform um, as opposed to an engaging platform. And then there are those who, who take it to heart and take it seriously that if they're going to be on the platform, then they should um, learn its language and, 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 and engage with its users in the way that they're meant to be engaged. Um, there are, there are risks to both approaches, uh, which is that, you know, sometimes I've seen politicians um, tweet out an announcement about something that's happening when like the whole social media conversation is just about something else and it feels out of touch. But like, that's not the worst thing. That's just, you know, someone on Twitter being like, huh, this doesn't fit with the Twitter conversation. Whereas there's a higher risk, obviously, of being very present on the platform um, and trying to engage with it. And then in the process, kind of, you know, stubbing your foot somewhere. So, follow-up question on that one. What do you think of Sing on TikTok? I mean, I like it. I, I, I like TikTok as a platform just because I think it's interesting. Um, and there's been very few platforms that just have like a grasp on a demographic as strongly as TikTok does. Um, and I think like the idea that you are not present at all on that platform um, 
sometimes means like missing out on a certain population. This is not the same with, you know, Twitter. Like for example, if you're on Twitter, um, it's easy for you to imagine reaching that same audience in other ways. If you're on TikTok, like that's like the only way to reach that audience. Um, so I like that it's trying, but the problem is that TikTok is corny as hell. And so all of the TikToks that get posted, um, like it's easy to make fun of them, but like, honestly, that's the language that platform speaks. So I'm broadly here for it. Okay, I have a question from Jen. Jen, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question directly? Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, we, um, I'm here calling from um, Steveston in British Columbia. We do have a politician. Well, actually, she, I think she's bowed out now. Her name's Elizabeth May. She was incredibly transparent, and she actually put her accounting, um, all her financial records online so her constituents could see when and where and why she was spending money. Um, I'm just wondering about the future of transparency in politics um, and, and whether you think that having um, something, a system other than oppositional would be best because we do spend a lot of energy fighting against each other instead of working cooperatively towards achieving common goals. I, I love that world that you just described, Jen, <laughs> where, where everything is laid out there so there's no gotcha because it's just there, go look it up. Uh, it's, and it's funny because we were just before the, the session started this afternoon, we were talking about Bill Morneau and him digging through, I was imagining him digging through a shoebox of receipts to try to find out if he paid back the 40,000 and then he realized he didn't. And I just, <laughs> and so I, that, that kind of the financial statements is, is sort of fresh in my mind and fresh in the, in the news cycle. I mean, yeah, wouldn't that be, like if it was all just out there and you could you could kind of make assessments yourself and then the media wouldn't be sort of playing a go-between and there wouldn't be all this time and money on access to information requests to try to ferret out information. Um, now, Jen, I, I assume you're talking about her spending like on the campaign or did you mean her personal finances and all, all of that kind of detail? No, it would just be money that was would have been spent in a political nature, not her own personal account. Right. So public money, the public, the spending of the public money. Yeah, I like that even better. Why? Why shouldn't we see how all the public money was spent? Uh, and you're right. I I love this idea of then we could spend time talking about policies that matter to Canadians and how it's going to affect their bank accounts as opposed to. Mm -hmm. digging around and yeah doing the gotcha stuff okay follow-up question from Megan Megan would you like to unmute yourself okay hi um, so I actually had a question um, about you know politicians who might have pressure to be too authentic so at kind of many points in the presentation you said be authentic be authentic and I'm wondering if politicians could, you know, take that too far, um, if you can prepare to be authentic. So I'm thinking of like Elizabeth Warren, Instagram living herself, like chugging a beer in, uh, in her kitchen. Is that authentic? Is there a worry about telling people to be authentic will lead to kind of situations like that? Honestly, that's a, the reason that's hard to answer but, but, but a level of being a, a level of too much authenticity is that I think our expectations of politicians have changed. Our, our expectations of politicians have certainly changed. Um, they've been changing for a long time, but they've changed a lot with the era of social media, which is to say that like, um, you're not just buying into someone's vision of, of, of what your, your country could be or what your city can be. Um, you're, you you kind of have to buy a personal stake into who they are as a person um, and how they spend their time. That is not a change that came from the media. That is a change that came from politicians who decided to, you know, um, start uh, selling themselves as a brand. Um, and so the, the worry becomes that like, okay, so that's the race we're in now. Um, how do politicians keep up with that race? And, and, and one of the ways you can do that, I guess, is you press live on your Instagram app and you start drinking a beer and be like, how's everybody doing, How, how's everybody doing today? Um, it, this, it's puzzling coming from someone like Elizabeth Warren who had a plan for everything, had like a really detailed plan for everything. Um, 
but it starts to make sense when you start to think that like someone in the room was probably like Ms. Warren, the problem isn't your plan. The problem is that people need to see you being a person. Um, I don't have a fix for this because I actually don't think it's good for our politics um, kind of in the future. Um, but that is sort of the place where we are now. It's that, you know, that likability factor. Um, and I wonder if that's a, there's a gender thing going on there. Because if you watch uh, uh, Hillary, the documentary about Hillary Clinton or read her book, uh, if you've interviewed Christy Clark about her time in office as the BC Premier, um, and and the people around and Elizabeth Warren, I would I would say probably is true as well. The people around them desperately trying to figure out how do we make this super smart woman seem more likable and authentic. And for Christy Clark, I always remember in certain situations she would drop her G's. If she was out wearing the hard hat out in the, you know, in the mining town in, in BC, suddenly there was not a G to be found at the end of her verbs. And I never knew if that was her or if someone had told her to do that or if it was somewhere in between. And did it work? Did it make her more likable? Did it make her seem more in touch with the people? Uh, I don't know. That's, that's a really tough one. Again, there's that line between authentic, likable, and looking like you're trying too hard, which is, I think, Megan, what you might be getting at with the question. Yeah. Okay, I think we may have time for one more question um, from Pavan. His question is, there's been some pushback against the concept of objectivity in journalism, shown recently by the public resignation of Christine Genier from CBC's Yukon Morning. Do you think objectivity in political coverage should similarly be criticized, or is it something that should be protected in that field? Boy, that's an easy one Me. to end on. I love this. Yeah, one. that's a quick, what do you got, 20 seconds, go. Okay, I will say, because we've been talking a lot about this lately, object, we don't talk about objectivity so much in our newsrooms. We talk about impartiality, and I know that might sound, well, it's just a different word for the same thing. It's actually not. It's impartiality is based on can we put a process in place in our journalism that allows for me to come through the door in the morning and bring a bunch of baggage and subjectivity with me because I'm a human being, whoever I am as a journalist, but can I, can I have in, in place a story meeting structure, a, a vetting structure, a, a set of journalistic standards and practices that means that the product at the end of that is as impartial as I can possibly make it. Um, and that's where we're, our thinking is at the moment, and it's constantly evolving, I, I'll, I will tell you that. Um, but that we don't talk so much about objectivity. That, that feels like a, a kind of a dated sort of reference. Um, and and we're, we're trying to move away from it. We're trying to build on it, make it a, a bit more sophisticated, and, and try to be more open and transparent about, about it along the way, if that makes sense. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. So at this point, I think I need to hand over the mic to John. Mute myself. All right. Um, great. Uh, wonderful conversation here. Um, thank you very much to um, Elamine and Allison, um, you know, for your insights, for your pushing everyone. Um, and raising a bunch of very difficult issues. So for those of you who have enjoyed this conversation and have enjoyed the series, we invite you back on uh, August 13th um, for a, what is gonna be an opportunity um, to learn more about the Institute for Future Legislators, to do some of the activities that you heard about and saw today to engage with others who've been part of the program before um, and learn how you can actually be together in person because this has been a great series to have online, um, but the magic really comes from all those in-person interactions that we have when we're together with folks like Elamine and Allison like incredible other participants who you'll have a chance to meet in our next session. Um, so again, 
We're sending out uh, a links now that you can register right now and join us. Um, and then uh, for those of alumni who are with us now, we we'll hope to see you all there first at the event as the gathering. And then we have a bit of what we're calling our alumni after party uh, to hang out and catch up uh, because you'll be amazed what happens um, when you get together people who are committed to public service, to serving as elected office. Um, so if you can join us uh, in, on the 13th, please do. Uh, and we also hope that you'll stay in touch and join us again next year um, in person when we come back together and run the Institute for Futures Legislators both at UBC and with folks uh, that I'm involved with here at Ryerson. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and as long as I have hit all my key points, I will say uh, thank you all and we will see you hopefully in a month and if not, next year. And please stay in touch online. Take care.